Iron Lung is the current hit indie horror game that everyone and their mom is talking about. Or at least it was when I wrote this script like two years ago in a COVID-induced panic. But since Markiplier is apparently making a movie about the game, I figured I'm going to cash in and make a video about it. Anyway, the premise of the game is relatively simple. All the stars and planets in the galaxy have poofed out of existence. The only peeps left are those who are on space stations or in ships. Anything with any natural resources has disappeared. All that's left are a few random moons and asteroids. Some moons now have blood oceans, which you are sent to explore because no one knows why a blood ocean exists. Both the game and common scent dictate that Iron Lung is a pretty grim setting. No stars, no planets, no natural resources. Everyone left would be on borrowed time, right? Well, that's wrong. The game's horror elements are the very things that will allow humanity to not only survive, but to thrive. At least as well as you possibly can given the situation. So let's start with something simple. What is a natural resource? No, really, think about it. All resources are natural for the most part. Unless it's somehow 100% man-made, there's something natural in it. Look at the periodic table of elements. Only 24 elements on there are man-made. As in, they only exist in a lab. So, if all of those are gone, we still have almost all of the periodic table. We know all stars and all objects and natural resources poofed out of existence. But that can't be the case, because that means there should be no objects left whatsoever. Maybe it isn't following like a dictionary definition of natural resources. Maybe it's just things that are like useful for people. So any resources that are useful to human life have been removed. Maybe only objects that ha lack things like water or iron have disappeared. But if we look at our solar system, that raises some problems. There's no such thing as an object that lacks any useful resources. Asteroids fall into many categories, but for the most part they are mostly carbon, silica, or metal. Also, most asteroids have some water content, and many from further around the solar system are mostly water, methane, or ammonia. All of those are useful resources, to say the least. The game says that along with asteroids, there are only moons left. While it's technically not a moon, I think Ceres is a great candidate for a boring, resourceless moon. At least it's the closest analog I can think of in the solar system. It contains large amounts of water and iron ore in its core. So that's out of the question. In fact, you can rule out just about everything. Every moon or large asteroid contains something that humans can use. There are large amounts of water, methane, and countless metals to be harvested from asteroids or moons. There's no such thing as a moon or asteroid or an object in the solar system or universe at large that doesn't have something useful in it. All you need to do is mine it. And it's not a question of whether or not they could harvest the resources. The people of Iron Lung do have an industry. They have some industrial capabilities. They're able to build submarines. They're not great submarines, but it means that they can manufacture stuff. Just find a random rock and mine it to the core and boom, you have a bunch of iron. If it contains some water, then you're ready for a source of oxygen and hydrogen. In fact, speaking of hydrogen, the game makes it clear that stars and planets disappeared. But what did or didn't go? What is defined as a star or a planet? For instance, are nebulas still a thing? They're not a star or a planet, but they certainly are full of natural resources. If there are nebulas around, things are immediately less grim because you have a bunch of just free hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen is a great fuel source and would immediately help the people of this world get around. And if nebulas still exist, then probably star nurseries still exist. And we're just talking about the most basic nebulas. The nebulas that are the results of supernovas have tons of stuff. Supernovas are how most elements that are bigger than hydrogen or helium are formed. So... If there's one of those around, that's more than enough material to form a new Earth-like planet. At minimum, that's enough free metals and other materials to be able to expand out your space stations or make critical repairs. But enough about nebulas, let's circle back to protostars. Protostars are baby stars. They're stars that haven't fully formed yet. They haven't started fusing hydrogen, so they haven't become stars. But they produce a lot of energy. Almost as much energy as most main sequence stars. And you might be wondering where is all this energy coming from if they aren't fusing? Well, it's all the friction from everything getting pulled together tighter and tighter into a ball. The friction of all that hydrogen and helium and other stuff slowly forming into a star is making it hotter. Because they don't fuse anything, they're not technically stars. And so, were they deleted during the quiet rapture? Protostars in the space around them tend to be volatile places that lack many of the amenities of life around a normal star. Amenities such as, you know, the star being stable, able to block cosmic rays, or just not having constant solar flares that could kill everyone. That being said though, a protostar is a pretty good option when your other option is the void. 
They give off enough light and energy that a solar panel could be useful again. Sure, they're messy and unstable like most children, but you gotta work with the hand you're dealt. Protostars are just one option, assuming that they still exist. Let's go over some other things that are, for one reason or another, not technically stars. First off, we have stellar remnants. These are things like white dwarfs and neutron stars. They both are the still hot remains of dead stars. They do not fuse anything, so they are not stars in that regard. White dwarfs are the corpses of medium to small stars, like our sun, and they radiate heat for a really long time, slowly cooling down. White dwarfs in particular are a good choice because they are extremely tame compared to other objects. They are relatively free of nasty things such as solar flares or other solar tantrums. In fact, the only reason white dwarfs are not great candidates for life is that the process of making a white dwarf typically destroys all the planets orbiting it. And the white dwarf's relatively small size means that a planet would have to be very close to be in its habitable zone. But that's not really a problem if you just want to park a space station next to a white dwarf. White dwarfs often have their own nebulas called planetary nebulas. They're either caused from when the white dwarf is forming, or when they steal a bunch of stuff from another star and then explode. The next option is neutron stars, and to be frank, neutron stars are not the play. They are even smaller than white dwarfs, about the size of a few city blocks, but remember they have the mass of a massive star in that space. They are very rowdy. A normal neutron star is barely able to support life, theoretically. There are neutron stars variants such as magnetars and pulsars that have next to zero chance of life. A magnetar is a giant magnet so strong you'd be ripped out of from Adam, and a pulsar is literally a spinning death laser. It's not impossible to set up shop next to one, but I would only do that as a last resort if you don't have any other way to get like light for solar panels. Next up, we have the most famous of the stellar remnants, black holes. They are definitely not stars. I doubt black holes disappeared when the universe disappeared. There's no argument to say they are stars or planets. But that's a good thing if they're still around. It may not seem like it, but black holes may be one of the best possible bastions for humanity. A small black hole won't do the trick. What you need is a supermassive black hole with an accretion disk. An accretion disk is a disk of matter being sucked up into the black hole. So much matter is getting sucked up so fast that it heats up to absurd temperatures just due to friction alone. Temperatures that are comparable to a star are beyond that. At the right distance orbiting a supermassive black hole, it would not be all that different from orbiting a star. Okay, not that similar. For starters, a super high gravity would warp all incoming light, causing lots of weird stuff to happen in the sky. Also, if you're close enough, you'll be affected by enough gravity that time dilation will set in, which means that for every 100 years on the outside might be just like 10 minutes for you on the inside. But honestly, time dilation might be a good thing. If both black holes and nebulas exist, you just have to park yourself at a respectable distance and wait a few decades for new stars to form. You would be one final small generation of brown dwarfs or a bit bigger, but a star is a star, and if there's enough stuff, they might even have habitable planets around them. The biggest reason why supermassive black holes aren't that safe, honestly, is because of the wonky gravity around them, caused from the fact that they usually orbit in the center of galaxies. But the Quiet Rapture fixes that implicitly, because there's no stars around to mess up its gravity. So you don't have to worry about being flung out of orbit or a star careening towards you. You can just vibe. Without those pesky stars, being near a black hole is relatively safe. At least it provides some energy. The last major non-star objects I want to talk about are brown dwarfs. These bad boys are failed stars, so in essence, they are just really big planets. But just because they have not achieved full starhood does not mean that they are not useful. For one, their weird status between star and planets means that they may not have been blooped out of existence. If that is the case, not only are they a source of resources, but also they can fuse some elements. Larger brown dwarfs can fuse deuterium. Doing so does not produce a ton of energy, but it does produce enough that a brown dwarf can have a habitable zone. Zones are relatively short-lived, only lasting a few dozen million years. But that doesn't really matter on the human timescale. Brown dwarfs, like most of the objects mentioned above, contain a lot of hydrogen. And you don't need to worry as much about water, because most space stations recycle their water anyways. So the only things you really need to worry about are fuel and food. Along with that, you need a source of raw materials so you can, you know, either fix your space stations or build new ones. With all this in mind, here comes the biggest reason why Iron Lung doesn't suck that much. The blood oceans. Okay, hear me out. I know, I sound insane. But what I'm saying is the truth. The blood oceans are humanity's salvation. And it's not because they have all those little anomalies in them. Let's start with the simple stuff. Blood, 
as many of you might know, is organic. It comes from living things. In fact, blood is edible. Look at the British. Those scraggly-toothed savages have been eating blood pudding for centuries. And blood doesn't have to be a source of food. Blood is mostly water. More specifically, the liquid part of blood is called plasma. Plasma is mostly water, but also contains oxygen, glucose, electrolytes, and other good things humans need to survive. And as I have stated previously, if you have water, then you have a ready source of oxygen and hydrogen, and thus fuel. Also, blood contains iron. Not a lot, but you gotta work with what you can find in these situations. And there is a lot of blood. According to the lore terminal in the game, there have been at least four blood oceans that they found on different moons. And this is actually a lot if you think about it, because this is a universe with no more stars or planets. Nothing is gravitationally bound. Any moons they find are just ones they found in the void, not illuminated by sunlight. Which means that if they just stumbled upon blood oceans, they have to be everywhere, because you're not just finding a new moon every, like, five minutes. These things you have to search for in a universe where there literally are no stars, because everything is just a rogue planet at that point. Fun fact, though. The galaxy at large, even with most of the planets and stars gone, would operate somewhat normally for a little bit. This is because gravity doesn't update at the speed of light. The speed of light is basically the tick rate of the universe. So even if everything poofs out of existence at the same time, if something is a billion light years away, it's going to take a billion years for you to not be affected by its gravity. So, at least for a little bit, it would look like the galaxy is still just doing its thing. Back to my main point though, if you found four blood oceans in this disaster of a universe, they're everywhere. And these oceans contain a lot of blood. Once again, let's use Ceres as an example. Let's say the blood ocean is in Ceres' largest crater. The Kirwan crater is roughly 283 kilometers in diameter and 5 kilometers deep. As craters go on objects, Kirwan is in the upper end of the solar system, so it should provide us with a relative idea of how big these oceans can get. A crater the size of Kirwan would be able to hold about 283,854,118,559 liters of water. For the sake of my sanity, I pretend that the crater was a perfectly even bowl shape, because I don't have the time or the energy to calculate an actual crater's amount. So let's replace the water I used in those calculations with blood, and just pretend that they have the same volume and that my math is 100% correct, which I know it isn't. According to my math, a thousand people consume about 1,350,500 liters of water a year. So in a lake of only water, that's about 210,184 years worth of water. Now that's more than enough for the amount of people left. Now if you take the fact that blood's only 75% water, that's still 157,638 years of water. Blood also contains iron, so how much iron is in one of these lakes? About 63,867 metric tons, so you know, not that much. How many calories are in all that blood? Well then, that is 283,854,118,559 calories. So yeah, these oceans have a lot of resources. Not to mention all the oxygen and other trace elements in blood. Besides the blood itself, these oceans have other things going on in them. Throughout the game, we see several life forms just chilling down there. The main one being the big creature that kills you at the end, and all the weird little plant things down there. Given how there is no sunlight at the bottom of a blood ocean, I can only assume these plants consume the blood for survival. And I doubt the big fish survives off of just random submarines every once in a while. So what I'm giving at is, I think these blood oceans have some kind of native ecosystem. I think the main reason we don't see many animals while we're in the blood ocean is because the sub is going to the very bottom. If you've seen pictures of the real bottom of the ocean, you'll know that large parts of it are just kind of desolate and empty. So it wouldn't be surprising if we're only seeing like the one big thing down there. So there might be plenty of other weird fish frog things in the upper parts of the ocean that people just haven't found because they're not checking. And if there's a bunch of fish, you can fish the blood ocean. And I'd rather have some fish here and there than eat blood pudding for the rest of my life. And I don't know, maybe those plants taste like seaweed, we don't know. Or maybe I'm wrong and there's no ecosystem and there's just a bunch of weird plants and a random frog. I mean, there's a building down there too, so anything's possible. In the Iron Lung universe, technology is far greater than that in ours. For example, in that universe, the big divergence happened in 1992 when the first Mars base was set up. 
and the game takes place 300 years after that event. They have technology that is better than ours by a significant margin, and they've had that for 300 plus years. And we know they have access to a variety of resources. The existence of two different types of submarines proves that they have some form of industry, and all that combined makes me believe that they can eke out a living from this world they live in. I see that there are several ways they could go about thriving in this world. The first one is kind of simple. Just set up an operation near a blood ocean. Harvest it for resources if you possibly can, and just start mining nearby asteroids for resources. If nebulas exist, use those for hydrogen, otherwise use methane from asteroids for fuel. If the space stations and ships don't have artificial gravity, then set up on a moon ASAP so people don't lose all their muscles and bone. Or just set up on an asteroid so you can build an underground base, because an underground base will still protect you from random bits of radiation and particles. A universe with no stars or planets still has random gamma ray bursts traveling around. And, I mean, by doing that, you should be able to survive for quite a while. At minimum, you'll be able to get enough resources you could build more subs and explore the anomalies more, because those seem to be the key to getting out of the situation. The other way I could see them surviving is on the more speculative side. It's in my above-mentioned non-star objects. If white dwarfs exist and blood oceans are common, they might be able to find a blood ocean near enough to a white dwarf that it's orbiting. Set up shop on that moon, and with the heat and light from the white dwarf, you'll be able to use solar panels and maybe could make, like, a habitat on the surface. Obviously not open air, but with, like, an enclosed dome or something. It'd at least be better than just being in a space station. You could at least see a star. And if black holes exist, or if the people in this world have faster-than-life travel, you can just completely hack the system altogether. You see, objects that are going extremely fast, or that are in extreme centers of gravity, experience time more slowly. This is called time dilation, and it's a fundamental part of our universe. And if nebulas exist, it's only a matter of time before one of those bad boys collapses into a new star and some new planets. It will take millions or billions of years, but eventually there will be a new star with a new habitable planet. But obviously people can't survive that long. Unless you use time dilation. Either set up shop really close to a black hole, or just accelerate closer to the speed of light for a while, and you should be able to survive until there's a new star. It should only take a few decades or a few hundred years, which might not be survivable for any one generation of people, but with the right setup it means your descendants could potentially go live on a habitable planet. If nebulas still exist, and if they can collapse into stars and planets, eventually there will be a planet that at least is in the habitable zone and with some terraforming will be livable. And given your other options, terraforming is like a very low bar of entry considering your other options are die in space. Or there might just be a planet that already has life on it and you can just set up shop there. With all that in mind, I hope you can see that Ireland really isn't that bad as people think. Given all the weird blood oceans, anomalies, and advanced technology that people have, it is more than possible for them to survive, thrive, or potentially even just find a new Earth eventually. The less optimistic answer is they make an underground base on a moon and survive off of blood paste for the rest of time. Or maybe they'll be able to dilate time enough that they could survive until they find an Earth too and act like nothing happened. Or maybe there are literally no natural resources. Maybe every asteroid and moon left in the universe is made out of that plastic that they used to build toys at Dollar Tree. Which in that case, yeah, there is no hope. But my money is on Iron Lung being quite survivable, and the people just being so focused on finding anomalies, or just so not British, that they won't just eat blood. So that's it for this video. If you liked it, or if you even just made it this long, feel free to like and subscribe. That'd be great. I'm trying to figure out if I want to make more long-form content, focus 100% on shorts, or do 50-50. And so, I'm putting this out just kind of to gauge where it is, so. Other than that, see you next time. So that's it for this video. If you liked it, or if you even just made it this long, feel free to like and subscribe. That'd be great. I'm trying to figure out if I want to make more long-form content, focus 100% on shorts, or do 50-50. And so, I'm putting this out just kind of to gauge where it is, so. Other than that, see you next time.